Thank you for joining us. As you can see, this meeting is being recorded, so you should get a permission pop-up window about that. Uh, this is Getting Ready for Reappointment and Continuing Appointment, Documenting Your Teaching Effectiveness in a Teaching Portfolio. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL, and I'll pass it over to Priya. Thank you, Shed. Uh, my name is Priya Doshi. I go by she or her pronouns. I'm the Associate Dean of Faculty and Inclusive Excellence. So um, trying to help people with their questions regarding continuing appointments. And I'll turn it over to Hannah. Hello, everyone. I'm Hannah Jardine. Uh, use she, her pronouns, and also a teaching and learning specialist here with CTRL. All right, thanks, everyone. Uh, let's get started with today's session. Excuse me. So we've got a quick warm up chat for all of you. So we're going to ask you in the chat to introduce yourself and your department. And please share what do you already know about teaching portfolios and what do you want to know about teaching portfolios? And there's no right answer since we're all here together. So uh, we encourage you to share. And let's take a minute just to do that. All right, so we've got a couple contributions already. Folks are curious about samples of teaching portfolio components. If employers have an interest, absolutely. Uh, some people don't know anything. That's perfect. You're in the perfect place. Um, constructing self-evaluations. These are great. Okay. And we're, yeah, we're going to share, uh, we're going to review a lot of components today. We're going to share uh, different, and we're going to share links to different examples. Um, there's examples on our website, and also we're going to link to some other ones throughout. So, right. People want to know what changed this year, absolutely, or what AU is asking for in particular. Excellent. Thank you for sharing, folks, and please feel free to keep sharing in the chat if you haven't already. Um, but we can move on to our next slide here. We're going to talk about a lot of uh, facets of the teaching portfolio, um, the things that folks mentioned. Um, so here are our guidelines for participation. Uh, throughout this workshop, we're going to ask that you, first of all, make yourself comfortable. Um, so uh, we don't expect everyone to sit perfectly still and participate. Um, we ask you to stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft, whatever you need to do as needed that helps you stay engaged and attentive. We ask you to be present and participate in activities in a way that works for you. So you know yourself best and you know what you're going to be able to contribute and do today. So we leave that up to you. Um, please ask questions and or share ideas in the chat. So sharing in the chat, is, any questions or thoughts you have is going to help us keep them organized and answer them in an orderly way. So we prefer that you use the chat today. And then, of course, we ask you to be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. We're all coming into this with different backgrounds and experiences. Uh, so we'll learn best from sharing with each other and respecting each other's contributions. For outcomes for today, um, by the end of the session, you will be able to first reflect on the purpose of developing a teaching portfolio. Second, describe the components of the teaching portfolio at AU. Of course, there are a million different ways to do a teaching portfolio, so we're just going to talk about our institution. You're going to develop a plan to document evidence of self, peer, and student assessment and other materials that would be relevant to a teaching portfolio. And finally, you're going to identify key examples of currency in the field and service as part of the omnibus requirements. And we're going to break all those things down segment by segment today and go over them in detail. 
And so a quick overview of the order we're going to take. So we're sharing this so that you know, um, you know, when we're going to talk about a specific topic of interest to you. We're going to start with a teaching portfolio overview, including the components of the portfolio, the process of creating a portfolio. We're also going to talk about the comprehensive narrative, since that's such an important part of the submissions that folks are doing. And we're going to, uh, Priya is going to speak about currency in the field and service and what that looks like as part of the narrative. Then we're going to dive into teaching statements specifically and finish on some options for assessment items. So what would you include in your portfolio as an example of feedback or evidence of teaching effectiveness from yourself, from peers, and from students? So we're going to ask you some of your questions we may say for the appropriate section of the presentation. So if you're wondering right now about uh, student assessment, don't worry, we're going to get to that and we'll ask you to save your question for that segment. All right, and I'm going to pass it over to Hannah. All right, thank you, Shed. Um, and I was just taking a look in the chat of what everybody's saying. It seems like there's a variety of people here um, looking for the, to put together portfolio for different reasons, thinking about how to make it more comprehensive, more innovative. How are we sharing it in interviews with employers and also even some evaluators here? So um, we'll be talking about this from those different lenses. Um, so. This is a, an intro slide for the components to, or the section to come, but what is the teaching portfolio? So we'll first talk about the purpose of it. Um, why do we create one um, beyond those extrinsic reasons? Like I need it for my continuing appointment. Um, what are the components of it? And what is the process you might take when creating it? So in terms of purpose and format, uh, before we give you a list of reasons to create a portfolio, we're interested to hear from you all why might you want to create a portfolio? And really um, encouraging you to think beyond, not just because it's being asked of you to submit, um, but what are some of the benefits you'll get from creating a portfolio or from doing this work and going through this process? And Gillian, or Gillian, um, apologies for the pronunciation, the slides will be available. So we will share these slides and everything else we share in this presentation um, afterwards. So I see a few um, ideas coming through in the chat that the portfolio helps you be reflective on what you do well and what needs improvement. Certainly that word reflection and that came up in that opening warm up as well, more creative and that it can be motivating. As you're reflecting about what you've done, you also think about your future goals and um, can help you think about creative ways to move forward. As a reflective practitioner, certainly reflection is a huge component of teaching. We look at what's working and what's not. Documenting what work, worked well, absolutely. So of course we're creating portfolios for tenure, promotion, job applications, um, but also like you are saying in the chat, there are many reasons why you might wanna create a portfolio and many reasons intrinsic motivational reasons to do this work as well. So that record of teaching effectiveness, reflecting on teaching, refining your practices, tracking your development as a professional over time. And you might even choose to share this with your students, with your colleagues on your professional website um, to show pride in the work that you do. And also thinking about possible formats. So um, typically for the files that you're submitting, it will be one continuous Word document that you'll turn into a PDF, um, but you might also think about including lots of links in that PDF or that document, um, linking to larger media files or other examples that you want to show case. Um, and then everything should be named consistently. So I'll, I'll let Priya speak to that point a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah. So there is a basically a standard format for how you name various parts of your teaching portfolio, which if you look in the checklist that was should have been given to you by your faculty coordinator, it will tell you exactly how to name those various documents, but it's just uh, so that you can be tracked more easily. And I, from the examples that I've seen in people that have met with us at the CTRL, some people choose to put everything into one continuous document and others choose to create a file where say uh, your annotated syllabus is a separate document from the larger file um, or the teaching statement is a standalone file or um, your narrative SETs are standalone. So it, it's really up, can be up to you or something that you can ask of 
those who will be reviewing your file what they prefer. Right. I, sorry, um, Priya, am I right in saying that the checklist will be shared during this workshop? Oh, you shared. Okay, sorry, my bad. No, no, no worries. Um, so there are two places where you should be able to get it. Your faculty coordinators in each of your units should have it. But if you want to just go directly to the source, if you go to the Dean of Faculty's website and look under tenure and reappointment and look under term, um, you'll see that the checklists are all there for whatever position you're applying for. Mm -hmm. Great. And we will include that link in our follow-up email as well so that everybody has it for reference. Um, so the components of the AU file and the teaching portfolio. So this workshop is about the teaching portfolio, but that fits within the larger file. Um, so we want to clarify that and talk through everything that's being turned in as part of your file. So you'll be asked to do a comprehensive narrative, which includes teaching, service, and currency in the field. And Priya is going to talk a little bit about service and currency in the field. Um, and then also an updated CV. But then the teaching portfolio is in addition to that comprehensive narrative. Um, so the comprehensive narrative will have word limits, but then the teaching portfolio is something separate from that. And your departments may have page limits or other guidelines for about how, how much this should take up. So the teaching statement, you would pull that teaching section from the comprehensive narrative. It seems like some departments or programs um, don't ask you to pull that and repeat it, but that it just kind of sits in the comprehensive narrative and then is, and that feeds into the rest of what you're including as part of the teaching portfolio. Um, but then in addition to the statement, you have supporting materials. If you're going up for promotion uh, on the tenure track or promotion within the term faculty line, you would need one item in all three categories. But if you're going up for continuing appointment and reappointment, you would just need one item from any of the categories. So we will talk later in this um, workshop about all the possibilities for each of these categories and give you suggestions to help you think through what's the best item to represent what you want to um, include in your portfolio. And then lastly, your SET numerical scores will be part of your file, but you do not need to do anything. Um, to submit those, those will be generated by OIRA and sent to uh, the reviewer. So also reminding you that one size does not fit all. So this is the overarching um, summary of what's in that checklist that Priya was referring to. But um, please check with your department, your school, your field in terms of expectations. So certain departments may prefer certain items under each of these categories or prefer certain formatting changes. Uh, so Brian's question for SET, will your supplemental questions? Past, they didn't come to my session on Thursday, but like, yes. Um, are we asking about, so the supplemental Likert scale questions and numeric scores, do you know the answer to that, Priya? Yeah, they will not be included unless you choose to include them. So later on, when we talk about one of the options under student assessment, that is a non-numerical measure. So like the SETs are numerical. So um, the, your supplemental questions or what we call the student narratives is something that you have a choice of whether you want to submit as part of your teaching portfolio. As long as you're not, if uh, actually, even if you are going up for promotion, you have other options there um, rather than submit those narratives. So no, they will not be submitted as part of your SETs. Uh, and I see a couple of follow-ups on that. Uh, Likert scale questions. Um, well, basically it's just summaries, right? So they're not, they're actually not even submitting your full numeric SETs. There's just like summaries with median and mean and things like that. So they're very short. Right. And in terms of a process for creating your portfolio, um, you're thinking about, you know, the, the typical trajectory might be that you write your narrative, you write your statement, especially your teaching statement. Then you think about what um, evidence and artifacts to gather and select to back up what you're writing in the statement. And then you put it all together, arrange and organize it. And this uh, process certainly works. Um, but what we do want to encourage you to do is think of this as an ongoing process that feeds back into itself, that your, um, your statement might come from what you're seeing in the evidence and artifacts that you're gathering. You might even write summaries to help you think through these materials. Um, and then that is kind of an iterative cycle of feedback and reflection. 
uh, and also encouraging you to think about what you've included and written about in merit memos or other documentation that you've had to submit at other points as a starting point for creating your narrative or um, thinking about what evidence and artifacts you want to include. So I will uh, turn it to Priya to talk more about the currency in the field and service components. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so currency in the field and service are the two other components of the overall narrative. So this session, as you know, is focused primarily on teaching portfolios, but we did want to touch upon this because for those of you that are going up under the omnibus guidelines, the omnibus guidelines were the ones that were created by the Dean of Faculty's office for any unit that wanted to adopt them. And the units that have adopted them are SOC, um, CAS, and um, OG. PS. So the other units will either be um, modifying those those guidelines or they will they already have submitted their modifications to those guidelines. But these these things remain constant across the board. So what is currency in the field? Um, we define this really just as staying up to date with one's professional and or scholarly areas. Um, so it's really what it sounds like. But what we're looking for here is that you demonstrate one or more of the following things. Um, conducting research, publishing and contributing to the scholarly profile of the university any kind of professional practice. And this would include consulting work that you might do, attending conferences, um, that type of thing, um, maybe some freelance writing or research that you're doing for an outside entity. Um, in addition, um, participation in scholarship of teaching and learning. So attending sessions such as this one, um, or attending sessions that are meant to improve the way that you you know, draft your syllabi or the way that you um, look at participation in the classroom would be examples of participation and scholarship of teaching and learning, as well as, you know, looking at content or, you know, articles and research on that topic. Um, pedagogical innovations. So here, you know, you can talk about the ways that you are using technology maybe differently in your classroom, or even ways that you have um, diversified how you count participation or, you know, how you look for um, different types of submissions from students as opposed to just written submissions. There's a variety of ways to, um, to identify that. And then <clears throat> lastly, contributions to the development of diversity, equity, inclusion and anti-racist practices that aim to build community collaboration and civil discourse within your field, discipline, or area of practice. So here, you know, you really do want to think about the work that you're doing in the professional space um, and how the work um, helps or benefits or increases, increases inclusion for a variety of people. And a lot of you, you know, may be doing um, things that you don't necessarily qualify under your currency in the field, but this definition is trying to be more expansive um, and inclusive of different types of um, activities in currency in the field. So um, the main tip here really is that faculty really should describe how these activities enrich their teaching, student advising, and mentoring. So what do we mean by that? An example of that might be, um, you know, if you're talking about how you did some consulting work over the summer um, for a client, maybe you bring some examples from that client into the classroom or um, something that you something else you might do is look for ways that your students might help support something that the client was trying to do um, you know through some sort of experiential assignment um, in your syllabus so think about how your um, how what you're doing in currency in the field really helps you become a better teacher next slide please so service is the other component, and service is um, demonstrated at really four levels, right? I mean, this identifies three, but within your teaching unit, your department, right? Um, within your academic unit, which would be your school or your unit, um, and then in the university as a whole. But in addition to that, you can all. In addition to that, you can also have external service, so the service that you do in the community um, would also count for this. <laughs> um, internal service should really be done at your the level that's appropriate to your rank and years at AU. So by this, we mean service that um, increases over time as a, as a faculty member has um, time at, you know, their time in service at AU. So for somebody that was here for their first or second year of an appointment, <coughs> excuse me, allergies, um, the internal service would really be more on, you know, less intensive pieces like work within your unit, work on a task force, um, showing up for recruitment events, um, showing up for graduation and um, 
convocation. Um, but, you know, as you sort of move through your time here at AU, as you become more senior in terms of your time here at AU, we would ex expect service to increase accordingly. So at that point, you might be looking to chair something, a task force or a committee within your school, or even look at university level service, um, you know, volunteering or being elected into a position that is university facing. So we're looking for that service to increase over time in terms of um, impact, really. Um, and when you're talking about your service in this tip section down below, <clears throat> I already mentioned increasing levels of service, but in addition, you want to really highlight in your narrative the time commitment and the depth of involvement in your service activities. So obviously, if you're a chair or if you're a faculty advisor to a student group, that's a more intensive level of service or some committees tend to meet a lot more. You might want to contextualize that when you're in your when you're talking about service in your narrative. Um, and then lastly, highlight your service to those from underserved backgrounds, um, whether that's students, faculty, um, or the community, right? What are, how is the work that you're doing in terms of service, creating a more inclusive space, um, whether it's within your field, you know, within the school, within the university, and there's a whole variety of things you can talk about there. One example might be Several people, you know, advocate for the collection of items for donation to AU's uh, food pantry. That's an example of service that often would go unrecognized. So again, this is meant to make this more expansive, what we understand as service, and it's meant to really help some of that invisible work that a lot of folks do be more visible. So, you know, think really about what it is you are doing and the impact that you're making. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to we have a few questions I think you can speak to about how to handle the overlap between sections, whether to repeat things, um, how to decide where to put something that might fit into multiple categories. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that this is really up to the individual faculty member. So um, what I like to say is you want to balance all sides of your portfolio, right? So if you have a tremendous amount of currency in the field and you have less service or vice versa, you probably want to think about how things can shift. Um, so just because something was a paid opportunity, a consulting opportunity, if it was something that provided an important service to a community, it could go into service, you know, if you feel like your service piece is a little bit lighter. Um, so you want to be really thoughtful about where things go and balancing the number of things because you want to have representation across service and currency in the field. Were there other questions? I think we got most of the other ones, but there are a few in there. So I'll, I'll turn it back to Shed to get us into yeah. our teaching statement section. Thanks, Hannah. So uh, in the we've talked about what the components of some of these teaching portfolios uh, can include. So let's take a step back and think about how we might present our own teaching in the portfolio. So I'm going to ask you to share in the chat, what words would you use to describe your goals as an instructor? And this is not, there's no right answer. This is particular to you and your class and or your classes and how you like to teach. So what personally for you are some words you would use to describe your goals as an instructor? I'll give people a minute to write, but in the meantime, I'll share a big one for me would be trust. Trust is very important to my classrooms. Uh, Hannah shares equity, engagement, ongoing reflection. I love it. Love to see what other folks, what words would you describe, use to describe? Building community. I love that. Develop critical thinking, inclusiveness, diversity. Yes, these are wonderful. A willingness to mentor, access and equity. These are great. Yeah. And these are the things that are driving themes in your teaching. It's something that you can bring out in a teaching statement. When you talk about how you teach, you aren't just talking about, uh, you know, what everyone, you know, we're not just talking about how important learning is, but how you approach learning and how you approach teaching. Motivate, develop, open space for people to explore new, new ideas. That's wonderful. These are all excellent. And this can be a really good start for your teaching statement. 
So a review of teaching statements and what they are, they are your chance to describe your goals as an instructor. So what makes you the instructor that you are? We all share a common goal that our students learn and grow, right? But how do you approach that in your own way? The teaching statement is the foundation of your teaching portfolio because the statement is where you state your beliefs, your philosophy, how you believe learning works and how you approach learning. And then that theme should come through all of your other teaching portfolio components. So all of the other content in the portfolio sort of serves as evidence or backup support for the statement that you make or the belief that you share in the teaching statement. So it should be one to two pages, single spaced, uh, between 500 and 1200 words to fit within your comprehensive narrative. And this is going to vary uh, depending on your goal and your rank. Um, Priya, could I ask you to speak to that really quickly? Yeah, so there are different word limits depending on um, what rank you're going up for. So for example, if you're doing like a one-year reappointment, it's really not rank, but number of um, number of years you're seeking. If you're going up for a one-year appointment, it's a thousand words. If you're going up for a multi-year or a continuing appointment, it's, I believe, 2250. Um, so the, the that, and that's for the total comprehensive narrative. So when we say 500 to 1200 words, we've basically pulled out a portion of your overall comprehensive narrative to be your teaching narrative. Um, so that's that's where the range of this comes from. Thank you for that, Priya. Um, so um, finally, it is a narrative in first person. So it's your story. So even if in your field, typically uh, things are published or written with a passive voice, the narrative is about you. So it should include I and it should include right um, narrative statements because you're taking ownership of how you approach teaching. All right. So here are some key components of the teaching statement, sort of breaking it down. We would start with, on the top right, beliefs. So what do you think or what do you believe about how teaching and learning work? What is your own sort of approach to those things? So we lay that out in the teaching statement. And then you talk about the strategies that you use to uh, meet those beliefs or accomplish those goals that you set out. So, you know, a lot of people said that things like critical thinking are important in their teaching. So how do you encourage critical teaching in, with your students? What strategies do you use? What activities, what assignments, what sort of, you know, uh, interactions do you have with them? How do you make those beliefs real? And then after that, we look at the impact. So we've talked about our beliefs and we've talked about how we're implementing those beliefs with strategies. How do we know it works? How do we know that students are accomplishing the goal because of the strategies that we use? So that's where you talk about impact. What's the effect on learners and on you as an instructor? Uh, this can include things like feedback and assessment, uh, student work, uh, student comments. We're going to talk about evidence a little more uh, later in the presentation, um, but you know, sort of showing why you use the strategies that you do, how you know they're effective. And finally, you wrap up with your future future goals. So no one's ever done improving at teaching. It's kind of a lifelong, you know, ongoing process. So what's next? What are you going to work on next? And, and where do you plan to grow and improve? All right. So we have a planning document that I'm going to share in the chat to accompany this session. And this is just something for you to um, take with you after the session. Give me one second to put that in the chat. And let me know if you're able to open it and see it. Harold, I really like, I think you just shared actually a very beautiful teaching statement, like opener right there. Education is transformative and open intellectual inquiry is the foundation of higher education and democratic society. That's a beautiful opening. Yeah. Tell me about your strategies. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready. That's wonderful. So you should be able to open and edit that document. We're not going to go over it in detail today, but this is for you to work on after this session because it has segments for all of those components we just talked about, brainstorming your beliefs, your strategies, your impact, and your future goals. So are people able to access that? Give me an indication. Yes. 
Excellent. Yes. And we will follow up with a document in our um, email with the slides. All right. So there are there is no uh, strict way of organizing a teaching statement, but here is one option we can share with you. Um, you would start with your introduction, introduce yourself. By the end of the first paragraph, your reader should know your discipline. Um, your discipline, the types of courses that you've taught, perhaps a little about you and what brought you to that work. You want to hook the reader, right, by um, sharing something with them to catch their attention, to get them a little interested in the work that you're doing and how you think about teaching. And then briefly introducing your beliefs, what you believe about teaching. So those things you shared in the chat earlier are a great starting place for that. Then you would move sort of classic essay style into your body paragraphs. Um, and so under your sort of major belief, you could break it down into the different sort of goals or sub beliefs that you have. So one paragraph for each one where you start by saying, you know, so my larger goal is this. So to accomplish that, I uh, focus on this with my students and I use these strategies and here's some evidence of the impact. So each paragraph will sort of capture one belief and how you implement it with your students and how you know it works. And you would provide examples from your practice. So you should give your reader a snapshot of what it's like in your classroom, of what it's like to be in your class. When you wrap up with your conclusion, you, of course, summarize your main points, tie everything together with that big overarching theme that you brought up in the introduction, and share your future goals. I'm going to check the chat real quick. Okay, I think we're good. Um, and I think we can move to our next slide here. Excuse me. Okay, so some quick statement do's and don'ts. Some things we talked about what you should include, a couple of things to watch out for, what not to include. The first are vague statements. Um, you know, like uh, teaching works like this, education is like this. Uh, this is where I also ask you, um, do you to start with your own words, start with your own experience. You don't need to start with something like since the dawn of time, teaching has been X, Y, Z or the etymology of the word teaching, I guess, unless you're a linguist, that would actually make a lot of sense um, or worrying using someone else's words. Right. Just like with something a student might submit to us. We want to hear their your perspective. We want to know what you're thinking. So off the bat, you should really start with what you believe in your philosophy about teaching. Um, of course, we discourage unsupported claims. A lot of folks underuse evidence uh, of, or assessment in their uh, teaching statement. And so we really want to encourage you every time that you talk about how a strategy works to support it with evidence from your class. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. Of course, negativity towards others. Um, this is a common pitfall, understandably, where someone might say lecturing is outdated. Well, consider that the person who's reading it might love lecturing. <laughs> so instead of saying, you know, everyone else is wrong, instead talk about what works from your perspective and experience. So when I use lecturing, I complement it with active learning to create variety for students, right? And I've seen it work in these ways. Um, this is a tricky one is an overabundance of citations. It's not a lit review, right? But you might find that a citation helps uh, reinforce something you say about how you teach or a strategy that you use. You may connect it back to your discipline or your research that you do. But we really encourage you not to take up too much of your space, your limited space with citations, probably no more than, I mean, max like a few a page. Um, and uh, because again, it's about your perspective and what you're sharing. So try and limit those. And of course, it should not be a summary of your CV. Um, so you shouldn't, don't feel the need to list all the classes you've taught and the rank that you had when you taught them and the responsibilities that you had. Your readers can find all of that on your CV. So instead, take advantage of the teaching statement space to talk about what you believe about teaching and how you make it effective in your class and context. So in sum, your teaching statement should be specific, positive or asset-based, not deficit-based, and personal to you. And I add a little tidbit on yes. the asset-based part, as you mentioned, not talking deficit about certain strategies, right, but also... Something we've seen when reviewing these is um, talking in a deficit way about students. We encourage you not to do that, or we would advise you not to do that. And saying things like, 
because students come underprepared or because students struggle with X or because students aren't really good at X, I do this. Um, so instead thinking about how to speak about the assets students bring to your course and how the things that you do build upon those assets. Yeah, I love that, Hannah. So some key takeaways about the teaching statement just to wrap up uh, this segment, um, include your beliefs, your strategies, your impact, and your goals in that statement. Make sure to back up your claims with rich examples from your experience and your interactions with students and make it personal to you. Um, so your reader knows that teaching is important. That's why they asked for this. They know teaching is important and that you care about it. So, you know, don't worry about convincing them of that. Um, focus on sharing your story and your experience. All right. And I think I pass it back to Hannah here. Yes. Thank you. All right. So we've talked about the larger file, the comprehensive narrative, the teaching statement, which fits within the comprehensive narrative. And now we'll talk about the other items you might include in the portfolio to back up your teaching statement. So um, before we go over those examples, we're curious, curious to hear from you all in the chat. How do you currently assess your teaching or what evidence do you have or do you collect um, to show that your teaching is effective and impactful? What are some of the things you're already doing that you might want to include in a portfolio? Emily, certainly assignments and student work, showing the students have demonstrated learning helps you assess, is your teaching working? Student feedback, and there are so many different ways to collect student feedback, which we'll talk about. Peer feedback, certainly. Also many ways to collect peer feedback. Office hours engagement, a way to measure, you know, how much are students interacting with you? Midway through the semester, assessing your teaching, Brian's saying, your observations. Hmm, Harold, students who have graduated who return to speak about your class. Certainly something you could highlight in a teaching statement or in your narrative. Hmm, Robert's saying, students are publishing in on-campus journals, showing how you've done that. Yeah, so some of these are, are the more, the ones we think of right away, right? Like student feedback, peer feedback, peer observation. But I also appreciate that some of these are a little bit more unique and some things that we might not have been thinking about, um, but now you could. So we're going to go through the three different categories for assessing your teaching, self, peer, and student. Again, reminding you that if you're going up for continuing appointment or reappointment, you only need one of these things. But if you're going up for promotion, you would need one in each category. Um, so options for self-assessment, there are many. Uh, so first, you might think about summarizing your professional development activities. And I have a slide on that after this. Um, and reflecting on all the professional development you've done to improve as, an, as a teacher. Um, you might create an annotated syllabus or annotate course materials. So what that looks like, we have guidance on this on our website. Um, so taking your syllabus and say, leaving comments on it or notes um, that a reader could see, you know, I, these are my learning outcomes because, or I chose these readings because, or this is my attendance policy because. Um, so really just explaining everything that you've included in your syllabus and explaining how it backs up some of your goals as a teacher. Same thing with course materials, you might choose an assignment and then annotate that or leave comments about why you designed the assignment the way you did and um, how students typically respond to the assignment. Uh, I reviewed a file yesterday with a faculty member who also annotated a lesson plan. So they described out their entire, um, I think it was a 75 minute class period, everything that they did in that class period and why they did it. So what, why they designed the class session the way they did and how it was designed to support student learning. So that was also a great idea. Um, you could write a narrative of changes you made to a course. So maybe you completely revamped a course during, um, during the pandemic, or you've completely redesigned a course, or you've created a new course. You can write a narrative about that course design and why you designed it the way you did, or any type of written self-evaluation of teaching. So really reflecting on any aspect of teaching in more detail with, um, the reasoning behind your instructional decisions. And Jeremy's question, are more specific guidelines 
uh, and examples, the answer is yes, we do have a page specifically on annotating syllabi and course materials. I think, Shed, that's that's the syllabus guide, but there's a the one from the portfolio page. Um, so if you're thinking about in the self-assessment category, reflecting on your professional development, um, you can think about all of these things. And these might be things you're including in that comprehensive narrative, but with the word cal limit, if you're running, finding that you're running out of space, um, you might choose for your portfolio item to be a more extensive reflection on your professional development, where you can really go into detail about all of the workshops you've attended, consultations you've done, the events you've been involved in, um, if you've presented at Ann Farron conference with CTRLs, things like that. If you've done a lot of mentorship and you want to elaborate on that, um, formal supervision, informal collaborations, if you've written a lot of references, letters of recommendation, um, or any awards you've received related to teaching. So then also for peer assessment, so that was self-assessment. Now thinking about peer assessment, if you're going in that direction, um, you might do a peer observation, which we have an extensive resource on to guide you through. Um, that could be having a peer or colleague sit in on a class and so observe you live and take notes and write up a reflection. Or um, you might even have recorded lectures from um, when you were teaching remote and share that with a peer and have them uh, observe, I guess, the recording. Um, also peer review of course materials. So just like we talked about with the annotated syllabus or annotated course content, you might hand over your syllabus or an assignment or something else to a peer and ask them to write comments like, um, these readings seem to be great for your learning outcomes, or I really appreciate the way you've done this, this, and that in your syllabus. And then lastly, yeah, and so Priya is saying in the chat for the peer observation, you may have recorded classes during the online period of the pandemic. Um, so, and then options for student assessment, if you're choosing to include an item from that category, the first one uh, would be student comments from your SETs. So that would be the qualitative or the narrative comments that students are writing. If you're choosing to have that be your portfolio item, you'd have to include all of the comments for one class per year. Um, so what we mean by all of the comments is that you're not just picking and choosing a few positive comments, but you're showing here are all the positive comments and here are all the comments about things that I can improve. And then you might even, in addition to that, write a quick reflection paragraph about, as you notice um, in the comments, you can see that students really um, respond well to X, Y, and Z, and they really appreciate X, Y, and Z. Um, but then their critical comments I've responded to in this way. Um, the next time I taught the course, I changed X, Y, and Z in response to their comments. So it's it's totally okay and, and reasonable and I think also just shows that teaching is a is ever changing to include negative or critical comments, which are really just opportunities for improvement, right? Um, and I can jump in here on the yeah, student yeah. comments. So um, the one class per year, it doesn't have to be the same class um, year after year. You could actually choose a variety of classes. We're just basically asking that it's one class per year for the years that you have taught going back up to six years. So for a continuing appointment, it's six years. Um, for reappointment, it might be as few as two or three, year, or three years, right? Um, so just wanted to clarify that. All right. Um, what else for student assessment? So you could also do a self-administered student feedback survey. Many of you mentioned doing mid-semester feedback. Um, so if you do do that, we have a, a slide next to talk more about that. Um, just like the student comments from SETs, you would want to include all of the data, both positive and room for improvement. Students' emails or letters, uh, those might be more supplemental or additional things to put in this category. Um, so if you do think you want to do that, I would check with your department or program if that counts as the item, but it might just be something in supplement to some of these other things. And then also the, a student feedback discussion, which could be led by a colleague or a peer, or um, the CTRL offers the mid-semester course analyses option, which uh, we just advertised. I think the email went out this morning. Uh, so thinking about self-administered feedback, we do have 
ref resources to help you put together a mid-semester feedback survey. If you're interested in including this in your portfolio, um, we recommend you anonymize the student feedback. So make sure you're setting it up a, in a way that students know that their feedback is anonymous, um, including all feedback from the collection section, not just positives. You might even ask a TA or a GA to administer the survey or even ask students to pull it up and then walk out of the room so they really feel that their um, answers are anonymous. Include uh, questions that ask both what is going well and what can be improved. So we recommend at least three questions. What is helping you learn? What is getting in the way of your learning? And what suggestions do you have to improve learning in the course? Um, but you might include a lot more. And we have templates and all kinds of question ideas on our uh, guidance page, which we will share the, um, the link for in the follow-up message. I'm just going to check the chat really quick. Um, yeah, self-administered, meaning you yourself, you are administering the feedback survey, both designing it and administering it, but we can support you in creating that. All right, so looking at time, Priya and Shed, I know I don't know if there's enough time to go into breakout rooms, but we could um, maybe for the next 10 minutes before we wrap up, um, just give people a chance to reflect, think, and add any questions that you still have to the chat, and then we can answer those for the whole group. So I'm sure that one person's question will be someone else's question, <laughs> including those who will watch this recording. I see Jane's question. Okay, so we're not clear about how many of those to include in a continuing appointment file, how much is too much? Um, so I think for the for the number of years, um, you want to go back, um, again, the, min the maximum really would be six years, right? And it's really up to you if you feel like your, um, for example, your narrative comments, if that's something that you want to include for continuing appointment, um, really tell a great story, you might decide you want to do more than one course per year, but your individual unit unit might put a limit on the number of evaluations that they want to see. So I would check that with your individual unit. But if, again, I would try to lean into the things that you feel best represent um, your teaching style, right? The things that are going to tell the best story about you. Does that answer your question, Jane? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I thought I read somewhere that you could pick a certain number to include I guess I just like I don't want to necessarily do all of them <laughs> that seems like it could be a lot of each in each bucket but I want to do enough to to provide the picture you know so I guess I'm just unclear I love that there are so many options that's great instead of just the SETs and just the narrative but it's like you know how, how much do I scramble to get the mid-semester evaluation to do you know to find all my past narrative comments or whatever, you know, I just don't know. It's like, it's similar to other sort of things in the university, how much is enough, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if you're going up for promotion, then you would have to hit all of those buckets, right? But if you're going up for just um, continuing appointment without promotion, then you really have the opportunity to choose among those buckets. So in other words, you wouldn't have to do both like a peer feedback and a a student feedback piece. Um, so, but I think it's, it's you know, again, it's kind of your judgment and also whether there's limits being set by your unit in terms of how much they want to read, because it can be a lot of material, right? right. Here's my like a hundred page appendix, you know, I don't think they want exactly. that. So <laughs> exactly. And some of them are being very specific about what they want, you know, from what I've seen of guidelines. Um, I do see a question in here about where you find the due dates for each school. So the schools should be communicating this to you directly. If you haven't been told when your file for action is due, I would definitely reach out to the faculty coordinator in your school or the associate dean in your school to ask them that question because they have deadlines that are set before the deadline for all the files to be sent from your dean's offices to the dean of faculty. And those are being set by different departments or sorry, different schools and uh, colleges. Okay. We do have a few people in this meeting who are reviewers, If not to put you all on the spot, but if you have anything to add to what we've shared here or um, generic advice for people as they're putting together their files, I'll open the space for that.
We have also a good question about how do you construct a portfolio if, when it's your first semester here at AU, which I think is a, a good question. Would that be for me or does somebody else want to take that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer. Um, my first idea is to draw on previous uh, teaching experience to talk about how you are approaching teaching now. Um, but I am, I'm wondering what you think, uh, Priya and Hannah, about uh, including evidence and things like that. Yeah, I think if it's your first semester here, um, you can, so you're talking about going up for, to clarify, you're talking about going up for reappointment, but you don't have one semester of experience yet. Is that, is that the clarification? Okay. So you, pro I mean, are you going up for reappointment this early? That's interesting. Um, I would think they would have you go up in the spring. So, um, you know, that you would have that one year, that one semester at least um, already covered. But um, I would definitely check with your unit because I know that some, and by unit, we do sometimes mean school and sometimes we mean your specific department, um, but departments have to follow their school's guidelines anyway. So, um, so I would ask them what you would do in that scenario in terms of um, how much information do they want from somebody who's in their first year um, as a term faculty member, it's in their first semester as a faculty member. You, If you have time to do the midterm evaluations, that could be one way to gather information, but you probably won't have time to wait for the SCTs to come out, for example. So those wouldn't be part of your, um, those wouldn't be able to be generated. They wouldn't be part of your file. Yeah, there's a question about um, since this new change in the reappointment requirement being just one item from one bucket, is that for this year that's being piloted or is that going to be ongoing? It's only for this academic year. So if you're looking for an if you're looking for an easier way to fulfill your teaching portfolio requirement, um, I would highly recommend doing going for it this year, right? Because um, for only this year, because of the short timeline, the short time horizon around when people have to submit their files and um, when the guidelines actually were came out. Um, we have abridged the teaching portfolio. So the teaching portfolio is something that actually came out of beyond SETs and was passed back in 2019. The reason this seems so new to people is because it was never implemented. Um, and that was because of COVID um, and other factors that sort of came in the way of making the full teaching portfolio implemented. So this year, even it's abridged, right? And that's what, that's why there's this new guidance. It's also uh, a I think a few questions about peer assessment um, before we say that it's it's completely up to you. I want to double check that are there requirements for what who counts as a peer assessment? I think that came up in the last session, whether say a, a graduate assistant or a teaching assistant could be a peer assessor or not. Um, can a staff member, an adjunct be a peer assessor or not? Or should it be someone actually above you that's assessing you? Yeah, it really is. Again, this is another thing that's really up to your unit. So some are being quite specific about who needs to do what piece of this, right? So whether they're they're deciding, for example, who sits on their faculty review committees, they're also deciding like what are the rules for um, who can review you and what that review needs to incorporate. Um, so I've seen some draft guidelines for a couple of the schools and they're trying to be really specific in those areas, which is going to be useful. Um, we're not setting that policy from the Dean of Faculty's office. All right, and you please feel free to continue adding questions, but you can also, um, answer this question in the chat if you have an answer to it. This is really just our way of gathering some feedback about what aspects of the portfolio you're most interested in learning more about. So as we continue to build out our resources, build out our guidance, um, collect more examples, what are you really still um, looking for support around so that we can build out our resources with you in mind? So if you have ideas for that, please share those.
Right. Well, I can put up our, our closing slide to thank you all. I think Victoria also has a link to an evaluation in the, that she will add to the chat. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, you should see a link in the chat for a feedback survey, which you can certainly, as you're if you're thinking about what you've learned here today and, and have new ideas for follow-up, um, you can add them in there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for joining us. It was great to be able to share all this information with you. You can certainly request consults with the teaching and learning team, and we will be following up with all the resources that we've mentioned um, in a follow-up email. I'll let both Priya and Shed say their any closing words or thoughts for everyone? Yeah, thank you all for joining us. And please do come back to us with additional questions. I know that this is a very complex process and, you know, it, it really does differ to some extent depending on the school and unit that you're in. But between, um, between my office and CTRL and really your associate deans are a fantastic resource as well. So I would highly encourage you to direct your questions in those various directions. Thanks. May I ask one quick question, Priya, because I think it got lost in the chat. Sure, of course. Can you please clarify if the word count for the teaching, the comprehensive uh, narrative by the dean of faculty office is the maximum, minimum, a suggestion? Do our units have any leeway in that number? Well, the question on leeway is that there probably is if they're in the school's guidelines, but they we set them as the maximum. Um, and again, that's to make the files manageable for the comprehensive narrative. So um, I believe it's 2250 for um, going up for multi-year or continuing appointment and 1000 going for a one-year reappointment. Okay, I appreciate this because we are literally writing those guidelines now for my unit and we wanted to make sure that what we come up with is not in confusion or in contradiction to some other guideline set somewhere. Absolutely. So, I mean, they can go into a draft, you know, if, if you want to change that. And then if it's something that the dean of faculty or the provost decides, you know, can't be changed, then it'll come back to your unit in terms of the feedback to those guidelines, because okay. all the guidelines have to be approved by dean of faculty. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely.